Good morning, dear friends. I am so blessed to be here this morning. It's, uh, it's been a special week, um, filled with God's mercy and His grace. I love the song that our friends just sung for us here of how grace was multiplied, our pardon was multiplied to us. I like that. It wasn't just added or just given in a, a little bit. It was, was multiplied it abundantly above and more than we could ever ask to cover all our sin. Hallelujah. What Christ gave for us on the cross. What blessings have you received this week? Ones that you know, ones that you haven't known or, or recognized. I mentioned to the adult Sabbath school of a blessing that happened down in Auckland, but it also this week happened in Christchurch where the local BP station was giving out fuel for a complete hour for free. Come and fill up your tank. What a blessing that would be, wouldn't it? That you can receive free petrol. This week I received a blessing. I was driving down the road just behind here. Is that Devron Street? Up here, the next one. Just turned around the corner, went down Devron, and I had to stop and pull over because I saw something absolutely amazing, and I had to take a picture. I saw a rainbow. Like, it caught my eye. Like, it was, it was so vivid and so brilliant. I wasn't able to keep driving. I had to stop and just soak it in for a moment, take a picture, and send it to my wife, actually. It was, it was absolutely amazing. And on that note, that is going to be our opening thought is we're going to talk about a rainbow for a moment as we begin our study this morning. So I would like to actually just have one more word of prayer as we begin our, our study this morning. So please bow your heads with me. Our Father in heaven, we're grateful for your abundant mercies and graces towards us. They're new, they're fresh every morning. And Lord, we come with open hearts, open minds, because we're, we're in need of you. We're in need of your Holy Spirit to speak into our lives, to challenge us, to grow us, to motivate us, to empower us, Lord, as ambassadors for your kingdom. So Lord, I pray you will just guide us as we look into your word now. Please give us your Holy Spirit. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Rainbow, the first rainbow in the Bible is found in Genesis chapter 9. Turn with me there, Genesis 9 and verse 11. There was a humongous flood that wiped the planet clean again. And we must take note that when God destroys the wicked, that it's not something that he takes pleasure in, but the Bible describes it as his strange act his unusual act, and God in his justice and in his mercy, he destroyed the earth with a flood. And then he says in Genesis 9 and verse 11, Thus I establish my covenant with you. Never again shall all flesh be cut off from the waters of the flood. Never again shall there be a flood to destroy the earth. And to signify that, he says this, and God said, this is a sign of the covenant or the promise that he's making with humanity, which I have made between me and you and every living creature that is with you for perpetual generations, that I set my rainbow in the clouds and it shall be for a sign of this covenant or this promise between me and the earth. So when we see the rainbow in the cloud, it should cause us to stop and to reflect on God's faithfulness, to reflect on his promise that he will never destroy the earth again with a flood. It should remind us of his uh, involvement in humanity and his just hand of when it has uh, been activated and when it has been stayed. This rainbow should remind us of all of these things. Now, I want you to take this little rainbow that we've just talked about. I want you to put it in the back of your mind for a few moments. We're going to come back to it a bit later, as, and we're going to finish as we talk again about the rainbow. Now, fast forward several thousand years, and I want you to go to the night of the Passover where Jesus, the Last Supper, where some may call it, 
And Jesus is sitting around the table with his disciple. Uh, with his disciples, and they're eating the Passover lamb. That Jesus had come to Jerusalem because he is the Passover lamb. That he is the one that is to be sacrificed, to be slain for the sins of the whole world. And he's sitting around the table. And turn with me to Matthew chapter 26. And he says to his disciples in verse 31, Matthew 26, 31. It says, And Jesus said to them, All of you will be made to stumble because of me this night. For it is written, I will strike the shepherd, and the sheep of the flock will be scattered. But after I have been raised, I will go before you to Galilee. Peter answered and said to him, Even if all are made to stumble because of you, I will never be made to stumble, Jesus. And Jesus said to him, Assuredly, I say to you that this night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. And Peter said to him, Even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. And so said they all. Peter seems to be, again, the one always putting his foot in his mouth, the spokesperson for the disciples. And that sounded really good. Even if everyone forsake you, we'll never forsake you, Jesus. We'll never leave your side. We're with you to the end, Jesus. And they all said it. Yeah, we're with you. Jesus was warning his disciples, and particularly Peter, of this aspect of Self-confidence. Now, a person needs to have self-confidence in, in, in the way that we should be able to navigate through life, you know, go in and deal in our business transactions, be able to look people in the eye and say yes and, and do this and say no, you know, have that kind of self-confidence. But the self-confidence that Jesus is warning of Peter here is this self-confidence that you're unwilling to be taught. You're unteachable. And have you ever met people like that? Or have you ever been in that place before, in those shoes? And I, I reflect back in my mind when I was a, maybe 13 or 14, and my brother, my older brother, awesome guy, godly man. He's a huge role model in my life. But he is an amazing musician as well. And he had scraped together all his money, and he bought a really expensive guitar. I won't tell you how much it is because you'd all gasp. He bought this guitar, and he is a musician that is warranted to have this type of guitar. It's amazing. And I remember when he got it, you could, you could uh, the inside of the case, it was this, this, it was like a kitten. It was so soft, the inside of this guitar case, because that guitar was so valuable, like you need a really good case to keep that thing cocooned and warm and cozy so that nothing would ever happen to this guitar. And you always, like, with, with sweaty palms, you, you take this guitar out of its case because it's so special and it's so expensive. And my brother would look you over to make sure that you were handling it just right because you want nothing to happen to this guitar. Anyways, we were at our house this Sabbath afternoon and some a family had come over. And there was this young boy, and he was self-confident and not in a good way And this unteachable way. And I remember very vividly, my brother's amazing. He is so, so gentle and so kind. And this young boy says to him, hey, can I try your guitar? Now, he doesn't know what he's asking. Because this isn't just some guitar that's from the, a garage sale from down the road. But this guitar, it's worth more than your education, right? It's value. It's very valuable. It has this koa wood backing on it. It sounds like a thousand angels when it sings, right? It's a beautiful guitar. He says, can I try your guitar? And he doesn't know how to play guitar, this kid. And he picks it up, and my my brother very, very graciously hands over this guitar to him. And this little boy, he takes the guitar, he's like, yeah. And he kind of does some like rock and roll moves with it. And my brother's just kind of like, scared, you know, for his guitar. And he sits down and he whacks the back of the guitar against the table. And that was the first dent in the guitar. 
And he's like, oh, sorry. Again, he doesn't know what he's doing. And he's trying to teach him, no, hey, be, uh, be careful. Jesus is saying this to Peter. Be careful. This self-confidence could hurt you. It could bite you. And he says, assuredly, I say to you tonight, before the rooster crows, you're going to deny me three times. But Peter says, no, no, even if they all, I'm void of temptation. I would never forsake you, Jesus. This aspect of self-exaltation, Jesus had warned them many times. If you go over to Luke chapter 18, Luke 18 and verse 19, Luke 18 and verse 9, sorry, 18 verse 9. Jesus tells a parable, he says, And he spoke this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and despised others. He says, Two men were in the temple and they went to pray, and one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. And the Pharisee, he stood and he prayed with himself, God, I thank you that I am not like other men, extortioners, unjust, adulterers, or even as this tax collector right over here. This man, he recommends himself to God. He says, I fast twice a week. I give, of, I give tithes of all that I possess. And the tax collector, he's standing afar off. He would not so much as raise his eyes to heaven, but he, he beat his breast saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And Jesus says, I tell you, this man, the one that was beating his, his hand upon his chest, crying out for God's mercy, rather than recommending himself to God of all his righteous deeds, he says, this man, rather than the other, Sorry, I tell you that this man went down to his house justified rather than the other. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. This aspect of this putting yourself out there, trying to recommend yourself to God, saying, even if everyone else will forsake you, I won't, was not an unfamiliar topic to Peter. He would have known the scriptures of Proverbs chapter 3 and verse 7. It says, Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. He would have known the passage of Proverbs 12, 15 that says, The way of the fool is right in his own eyes, but he who heeds counsel is wise. In Isaiah 5, 21, Woe to those who are wise in their own eyes and prudent in his own sight. Look with me in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12. Yeah, there it is. 1 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 12. It says, Therefore, let him who thinks he stands take heed lest he fall. This is what Jesus is trying to tell Peter in this moment when he is being self-boisterous and self-recommending. Careful, Peter. Careful. You're handling a precious moment. You don't know what you're doing. Be humble, be teachable, Peter. They finished their supper that night and they sing a hymn and it says, and they went out that night to the garden of Gethsemane. And back in Matthew chapter 26, we continue this narrative here in Matthew. And as they enter this, this special place, that a place that Jesus often frequented there, he often went there to, to spend time. It was an easy place to, you're kind of in the city, but just out of the city of Jerusalem, it was a nice place to camp and to rest under the olive trees of the Garden of Gethsemane. And, and in Matthew 26, in verse 36, it says, Then Jesus came with them to the place called Gethsemane, and he said to the disciples, Sit here while I go and pray over there. And he took with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, James and John, and he began to be sorrowful and deeply 
distressed. And he said to them, my soul is exceedingly sorrowful, even to death. Stay here and watch with me. Jesus is saying here, he's feeling the weight of the sins of the world on his shoulders. And he's saying, my soul is dying here. And he's crying out to his friends. But you know what it's like after you've had a big feed. You get a bit sleepy. You get a bit tired. Then they don't know the significance of the hour that they are in. And it says in verse 39, but Jesus, he leaves the three. It says, and he went a little farther. Jesus went a little farther and he fell on his face and he prayed. Friend, do you ever feel God is asking you to do something that is difficult, that is hard? He's asking you to follow in his steps. An important point I want to note here is that when Jesus asks us to follow him, he goes a bit farther. He's not someone that walks side by side, but he is our leader. Yes, he walks with us, but he walks for us and he walks behind us. He surrounds us. And when Jesus asks us to come, he says, come. And you think you've gone your farthest step that you could ever take, Jesus goes a step farther. And he's there. He's there with you. And Jesus goes a little farther and he falls on his face and he prays saying, oh my father, if it is possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. Then he came to the disciples and he found them sleeping. And he says to Peter, what? Couldn't you all not watch with me for one hour? It's interesting how the narrative is so closely tied and keeps drawing out Peter as if he's reminding him of how before he was so boisterous and so proud that he would never forsake his Lord and Savior. And Jesus, could you not pray with me for one hour? Three times Jesus goes and he prays and three times he comes back and he finds his friends sleeping in an hour when he needed them the most. You know, when we face joyous experiences, when we face our happy moments, we like to share. Like we see it on our social media accounts. We say, hey, look at this. Look what happened to me. We like to put it out there. We like to. But when we are facing a burden that is too great to bear, you need a friend that you must share it with. Yes, we have our Heavenly Father, but what friend can you reach out to and to share in your moments of burden? Is there a friend right now that is needing your shoulder to cry on, to love them in their moment of distress? And this is what Jesus is asking for here. And three times he comes back and finds them sleeping. And I pray that may not be the case in our life. When your friend comes to you asking for help and asking for love and asking for assurance, I pray that we're awake. Amen? Verse 45, jumping down, it says, And then Jesus came to his disciples, and he said to them, Are you still sleeping and resting? Behold, the hour is at hand, and the Son of Man is being betrayed into the hand of sinners. Rise, let us go see my betrayers at hand. And you know the story of how this mob of men come into the Garden of Gethsemane with torches, with spears, and with swords. And they come to collect a criminal. That's what they're anticipating, but they see a merciful and peaceful Savior, Jesus In verse 51, it says, And suddenly one of those who were with Jesus, he stretched out his hand and drew his sword and he struck the servant of the high priest and he cut off his ear. It's interesting that Matthew, Mark, and Luke, they all say there was, uh, I don't know, just, there's one of us that came out with a sword and took the guy's ear off. But if you compare Scripture with Scripture, it is John that says, no, nah, it was Peter. Young John says it was Peter. 
And he says that Peter cut off the priest, the, the servant of the high priest's ear. You know, he wasn't a sword wielding man, he was a fisherman. And that Peter, he was again trying to demonstrate that, Lord, when it really counts, I'm going to stand by your side and I will defend your kingdom. And he was trying to split that fellow's skull right open, didn't he? And as that sword came down, thankfully, he missed and it took off his ear. It's interesting. I always had this thought when I read the story as a child of Peter going up and just kind of like sawing the guy's ear off. That's not what it was, was it? The guy was, it was called a, a near miss, and we would have had to ride, ride up a, a job safety analysis or something. We would have had to record that in our church books, wouldn't we? It was a near miss. It's a miracle. Jesus heals and puts the, the ear back on. And Jesus says in verse 52, put your sword in its place for all who take the sword will perish by the sword. Or do you not think that I cannot now pray to my Father and He will provide with me more than 12 legions of angels? How then could the Scriptures be fulfilled that this must happen? They captured Jesus. In verse 57 it says, And those who had laid hold of Jesus, they led Him away to Caiaphas, the high priest where the scribes and the elders were already assembled. And notice the contrast in Peter's demeanor. It says, But Peter followed him at a distance to the high priest's courtyard, and he went in and he sat with the servants to see the end. Now apparently John had some special relationship with someone in in the court of the high priest's house. And he had the inside connection. And, and John and Peter were able to get into this inner chamber, into this place where this was all going on. And you read in Mark chapter 14 that, that Peter is now, rather than being that bold and, and, and confident man wielding a sword, he's, he's sneaking around, he's sneaking around in the shadows, following Jesus from a distance now. And he slips into this courtyard with his buddy John. And he, he goes over to where the servants are and he starts to warm himself by the fire. While all of this is going on, this, this jury and this, uh, this court session is going on trying to condemn Jesus. And you can just imagine this fisherman trying to blend in, right? And the, the, the flickering light is upon his face of this fire that he's trying to warm himself by. And someone sees his face in the firelight and he says, Hey, hey, you, you were one of them, weren't you? He says, No, no, not me. I, w I wasn't one of his disciples. Such a stark contrast where he was saying, I will never leave you. Now he says, I don't even know him. Another says, Hey, surely... You were one of Christ's disciples. No. He says, yes, your speech betrays you. You sound like a man from Galilee. And in the Bible says in Matthew chapter 26 and verse 74, then he began to curse and to swear. Being a fisherman, he knew how, didn't he? He says he began to curse and to swear, and he says, I do not know the man. I never seen him. I never knew him. And immediately, a rooster crowed. Uh, look with me in the book of Luke right now, and I want you to see what Dr. Luke brings to our attention here in this very moment when this is taking place. Luke chapter 22 and verse 60. <clears throat> Luke 22, verse 60. It says, But Peter said to the man, Man, I do not know what you're saying. And immediately while he was still speaking, the rooster crowed. It's almost like the rooster, it pricked his conscience. And in that moment, it inspired him to look to Jesus. And it says in verse 61, Then Jesus turned and he looked at Peter. And then Peter remembered the word of the Lord. How he had said to them, before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. 
You can almost picture that time stood still there for a moment. And the echoing of the rooster's call is in the air. And Peter and Jesus, they lock eyes. And Jesus looks at Peter and he's not giving him that look of saying, you just wait, you'll get your turn. You're next. No, that's not what Jesus is saying with his eyes. But you see Jesus loving Peter with that look. He says, I know what you've done. You betrayed me, you denied me, but I love you. I love you. Verse 62 of Luke 22, it says, So Peter went out, and he wept bitterly. Just imagine that big, shaggy, hairy-chested fisherman bawling like a baby. Because he all of a sudden recognized who he was. The man that he wished to be and what he actually was. It came to light. It would have been a dark weekend for Peter, wouldn't it have? It was the last look he saw on Jesus' face of him just loving him. And he goes out and he cries and he weeps. That was Peter's first fire. I told you I like campfires. And Peter is sitting around the campfire. And he came to a clear understanding of who he was. And that was his first fire where he denies Jesus around that campfire, where he betrays his Lord and Savior, where he forsakes his king. Fast forward to the morning of the tomb. I want you to go with me to Mark chapter 16. Mark chapter 16 and verse 2. Mark 16, verse 2, the Bible says, Very early in the morning and on the first day of the week, they came to the tomb, these women, they came to the tomb when the sun had risen. And they said among themselves, Who will roll away the stone from the door of the tomb for us? But they kept going, didn't they? And when they looked up, they saw that the stone had already been rolled away, for it was very large. And entering the tomb, they saw a young man clothed in a long white robe sitting at the right side. And they were alarmed, quite naturally, right? And they said, but he said to them, do not be alarmed. Don't be afraid. You seek Jesus of Nazareth. He was crucified, but he is risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him. And then it says, but go and tell the disciples and Peter. Go and tell the disciples and Peter that he's going before you into Galilee and there you will see him as he said to you. When that message came back to the disciples, you can almost see Peter sitting there in the corner with his tear-stained eyes. And these women are announcing, hey, Jesus is alive, and, and there's, there was this angel that was in the tomb, and there was, the clothes were folded there, and the stone was, you know, and they're just trying to make sense of it all. And, and Peter, and Peter, Jesus wants you to know that he's alive. Have you ever been offended or betrayed by a friend, and you want nothing to do with them after? Not Jesus. Make sure Peter knows. And that Peter knows that I want to meet with him again. Go and tell the disciples and Peter. After the resurrection, Jesus showed himself a few times in different places. You recall the story on the road to Emmaus in the upper room when he he ate the bit of honey and the fish. And later in Galilee... We, we turn in our narrative now to the book of John, and we're going to close there in John chapter 21, that the disciples, they, they kind of didn't know what to do with themselves now, and so Peter says, hey, 
let's go fishing. That sounds like a good idea. So him and, and, and about six or seven other disciples, they take off and they go back to Galilee to do a bit of fishing. And they go out all night fishing at the prime time to catch fish and they catch nothing. That's a familiar story to me. That's about my luck when I go fishing. And it's just on daybreak and they're quietly gliding back into shore in their boat and this man calls out from the shore and he says, children, did you catch anything? And they said, nah, no, nah, we didn't get anything. He says, throw the net on the right side of the boat. <sighs> Why not, eh? So they throw in the net. And all of a sudden it is full. And not just with the little fish. The Bible says with the big fish. It's full and it's bursting. And right there and right then, it says in John chapter 21 and verse 7, it says, therefore the disciples whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it's the Lord. John was quick to recognize. He says, it's the Lord. Now when Simon Peter had heard that it was the Lord, he put out, he, he took off his outer garment that, and he removed it and he plunged into the sea and he swims to shore. That burden on his heart of him openly saying, I will never leave you nor forsake you and then openly denying and betraying his Lord was heavy on his heart and all he wanted to do was run to his Savior, is run to the feet of Jesus. Verse 9, and as soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there and fish were laid on it and bread. Jesus was making them breakfast. And Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish which you've caught. And Simon Peter went over and he, he was just, yes, Lord, whatever you say, right? And he drags the net to land full of the large fish, 153 of them. And there were so many, but the yet net was not broken. And they sit around a campfire, eating breakfast, just as friends and as men. Isn't that special? <laughs> and then Jesus takes Peter aside in verse 15, and he says, So when they'd eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? You know, before he had boasted and says, Jesus, of course I love you more than anyone. Even if they forsake you, I won't. And Jesus says, Peter, really? <laughs> After all we've been through, do, do you love me more than these? And Peter says, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he says to him, feed my lambs. 16, and he says to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And he said to him, yes, Lord, you know, you know that I love you. And he said to him, feed my sheep, tend to my sheep. And 17, and he said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? And Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Peter, three times he denied his Lord and Savior sitting around a campfire. And three times, while sitting around a campfire, Jesus welcomes him back in to the apostolic, the, Apollo, the apostles' fellowship. He welcomes back in and he forgives and he gives them three times to confess his allegiance again to his Lord and Savior. And he forgives him. There's these two campfires recorded in Scripture. One is full of denial, of rejection, of forsaking their Lord. And the second fire that Jesus invites his disciples around is full of forgiveness, of warmth, and love. You remember the rainbow at the beginning we talked about? I want to show you from Scripture, and um, just for sake of time, we're going to go to just one passage and we're going to turn to Revelation chapter 4. Revelation chapter 4, where we see a picture of a rainbow. 
It's interesting that in society and, and in every good and gracious, wonderful thing that God gives us, it seems that the devil likes to make a counterfeit, that he likes to uh, um, taint that picture that God is trying to, to give us through these beautiful symbols in Scripture. And the rainbow in modern society is a very different picture, but in the Scriptures, the rainbow paints a beautiful picture. And from Genesis, we see it as that promise that God will never wipe the world again with a flood. It's a promise of his mercy, isn't it? But in Revelation chapter 4 and verse 2, we see this, this story, this, this picture of the throne room in heaven, God's judgment seat. And it says in verse 2 of Revelation 4, Immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, there was a throne set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. And he who sat there was like a jasper and a sardis stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne in the appearance like an emerald. This is a picture of God's throne room in heaven. And what surrounds it? It's a rainbow. It's a symbol. That God's throne, it is a symbol of God being just. He is a ruler. But that rainbow surrounding his throne is a symbol that he is also a merciful God. And friend, I need to ask you the question this morning. Is that what campfire are you sitting around today? These two campfires that Peter sat around, he had the fire that he denied, he rejected, he forsook his Lord, and the fire that received him back, received Peter back into the fellowship of the fold. What fire are you needing to sit around today? Are you needing to sit around the warmth of that Peter's second fire? To feel the warmth, to feel the love of your Savior, to sense his forgiveness, to sense the love in his eye of him looking you in the face. If that's your desire this morning, I invite you to receive that forgiveness that Jesus so freely offers. And let it soak and saturate your life and go forward boldly Offering that same forgiveness to others, to others that you need to call around a fire and say, I forgive you too. Amen. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're so grateful for these demonstrations in Scripture that God, you are, are demonstrated as a loving, a just, and a merciful God, that your judgments are true and you're fair. You're so kind, you're so good, you're so forgiving. And I'm so thankful for the story of Peter and how even though he, he messed up big time, but you called him back. You invited him around that second fire and just loved him, forgave him, and gave him a calling and sent him forth. And Lord, if there's someone here today that is needing that second fire in their life, that sense of your forgiveness, that sense of freedom and assurance that you love them. I pray that you will warm them up today. Fill their hearts with your holy glow. Empower them, and may they go forward as loving ambassadors for you. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. In closing, we're going to sing Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine.